Hi guys, welcome to my channel. Today's focus is going to be these little things. And I know you're probably tired of hearing about viruses because of the pandemic, but do you really know everything that you need to know? Find out with me here in Deep Core because we're just about to start with a question. After the host cells are infected, a complementary RNA strand is synthesized and translated to viral proteins. What is the virus's genome and which enzyme does it carry? A. Negative sense single strand RNA with RNA replicase. B. Positive sense single strand RNA with reverse transcriptase. C. Negative sense single strand DNA with RNA replicase. Or D. Positive sense single strand DNA with reverse transcriptase. Alright, before we answer the question, I'm going to go over everything you need to know about viruses. So, First things first, viruses are not living. Do not confuse them with eukaryotes, prokaryotes. Those are living, viruses are not. Prokaryotes include bacteria and archaea. The biggest confusion is usually between bacteria and viruses, but they're not the same. Bacteria is living, viruses are not. Viruses are acellular, they do not have organelles, and they do not have a nucleus. Even though they carry genetic material, they are not living and do not confuse them with bacteria. A fun fact for you, the reason why antibiotics do not work for viruses is because they're designed to attack ribosomes. And since ribosomes are organelles, they're not found in viruses. They're only find in, found in bacteria. And that's why antibiotics are for bacterial infections, not viral infections. So again, I'm going to repeat this. They're acellular. They do not have organelles and they do not have a nucleus, even though they do carry genetic material. Now, another important thing about viruses is that even though they carry genetic material, they cannot replicate that on their own. They need some sort of host, whether it's us humans or it's another type of cell like bacteria. Now, that's another difference between bacteria and viruses. Viruses can inject themselves into bacteria, but bacteria can't do the same because viruses can't replicate themselves. They're obligate intracellular parasites. They cannot replicate their own genetic material. They need some sort of host like a bacteria or human. Whereas bacteria is a living thing, it's self-sustaining, and it can replicate its own genetic material on its own. So viruses actually come in many different shapes, sizes, and designs. So let's jump right into it. What you see in front of yourself is the simplest structure of a virus. So let's begin with the outside. This is a protein coat, which is called the caspid. Inside this protein coat is our genetic material. A step up from the simple structure is what we have drawn here. So this is our protein coat. Inside is our genetic material, but this time our caspid is enveloped into another layer made out of phospholipids. Remember that cell membranes are also made of phospholipids and this is very important when a virus is trying to enter a cell. It can simply just fuse itself to the membrane because the envelope is also made out of phospholipids. And this layer is actually called an envelope. In addition to the phospholipids, we also have glycoproteins that are part of the envelope and, and allow for recognition when trying to enter host cell. Before we move on, I want to make a clear distinction between the two structures that we've discussed, so not enveloped and envelope. So the envelope tend to be more sensitive to heat. They're also more sensitive to detergent and desiccation. Enveloped viruses are usually easier to kill. Whereas not enveloped are not because they're actually more resistant to disinfectants. And this is another reason that they actually last on surfaces for a longer time. Now, to make this a little more relevant and catch your attention, a fun fact for you. Coronavirus is actually an enveloped virus. And that is why it is so important to wash your hands. Now, the third structure that I've drawn here 
is different from the two that we worked with before because this does not inject itself into a eukaryote. This is specially for just bacteria. Now just write that here. A virus with this structure has a special name and that's bacteriophages. Now, do not make the mistake of confusing this with a bacteria. This is not a bacteria. This is a virus with a special structure that allows the virus to inject its genetic material into a bacteria. And the way that's done, so the first part of the virus looks the same as our structure number one. We have our protein coat, we have our genetic material inside. What's new is this, and this is the tail sheet, and this is the tail fibers. The tail sheet acts as an injector. That's what allows for the genetic material to insert itself into the bacteria, and the tail fibers are responsible for detecting the bacteria and connecting to it. So fibers connect, and sheet acts as an injection, inserts the genetic material inside the bacteria, but the body itself stays outside the bacteria. The only thing that's going inside is the genetic material. I keep saying that viruses inject genetic material, they incorporate genetic material into their host cell. Genetic material cannot be replicated on their own, they need their host cell. But I haven't focused on what this genetic material is. So that's what I'm going to do right now. So first things first, it could be DNA or RNA. It could be linear or circular. If it's linear, it could be single-stranded or double-stranded. So in other words, it could pretty much be anything. So everything else is pretty straightforward, except RNA single-stranded. They can be positive sense, or they could be negative sense, or viruses that have RNA single strands could be retroviruses. Positive sense is very similar to mRNA. It just gets directly translated to proteins. Negative sense is a little more complicated. Unlike the positive sense that just acted like mRNA that was translated directly, negative sense actually needs an RNA replicase. Now this is important because RNA replicase allows for the synthesis of a complementary strand. And then this strand is then translated to a protein. The way I remember the difference between negative and positive is just that negative reminds me of bad, so I know it's more work than positive. Positive sense, I think good, and that's why it just gets translated directly. Retrovirus is a type of RNA single-stranded um, virus that is enveloped, and it carries a reverse transcriptase. This is very important because that's what makes retrovirus different from other types of viruses because this allows for a synthesis of DNA strand from the RNA single strand. This DNA then travels to the nucleus where it gets integrated into the host cell's genetic material. And that's why retroviruses like HIV are very hard to treat because the only way to really treat them is to kill the cell that's infected. This is extremely important, so I just wanted to emphasize this again. So negative sense carry RNA replicase, which makes sense because we're trying to make a, um, a complementary RNA strand. And then retroviruses carry a reverse transcriptase which also makes sense because you're reversing the order. You're going from RNA to DNA. Usually it's from DNA to RNA, but in this case, you're going from RNA to DNA. That's why it's reverse, and DNA to RNA is called transcribing, so that's why it's called reverse transcriptase. Before moving on, there's another type of virus that I want you to be aware of, and those are viroids. These are small pathogens that actually carry RNA single strands as well, except it's circular. Viroids tend to infect plants more. There are some that actually also infect humans, and an example is hepatitis D. 
even though hepatitis D by itself is not able to do anything, but if the person is co-infected with hep B as well, so if someone has hep B and D, then you see silencing of genes, and that's what viroids do. Viroids are responsible for silencing genes. In plants, when these genes are silenced, sometimes they can even cause metabolic and structural rearrangements, and certain essential proteins are no longer able to be synthesized because these genes are silenced by viroids. So the last thing we're going to be focusing on is the viral life cycle, which has three steps. Infection, so entering the host. Second step is translation of and progeny, so creating its copies. And the third step is releasing the progeny, releasing the copies. Now let's go into more details. The first step is infection. And the most important thing is that viruses have proteins that are able to recognize their host cell because the host cells have receptors. If the virus is not able to recognize these receptors, the host cell is almost invisible to them. So the infection's first step is to be able to recognize these receptors, and then it's able to enter the host cell through a couple of processes. So one is endocytosis. Another is fusing with the plasma membrane. And another way is injecting its genetic material into the host cell directly. So this is bacteriophages. I just wanted to remind you that. Now, once the genetic material or the virus itself is inside the host cell, the genetic material has to go to the designated positions. So if it's a virus that carries just DNA, that goes straight to the nucleus. If it's positive sense RNA virus, it stays in the cytoplasm to be translated to proteins. If it's negative sense RNA, the complementary strand is made, and then it still stays in cytoplasm in order to be translated. For retroviruses, RNA becomes DNA with the help of the reverse transcriptase, and then this DNA also goes to the nucleus. Once in the nucleus, the DNA gets transcribed to mRNA, and then the mRNA goes to the cytoplasm where it's translated to proteins. So translation leads to proteins. These proteins also include caspids which are protein codes that enclose the genetic material for the virus. But this is now happening in the host cell. So when the genetic material is replicated in the host cell, the caspids are able to enclose the replicated genetic material, forming something called viral progeny. Now, when a host cell has too many of the viral progeny, it goes through a couple of steps in order for them to be released. One thing that could happen to release this viral progeny is cell death. When the cell dies, it bursts, and it spills out all the viral progeny. Second thing that can occur is the lysis of the cell. So when the number of viral progeny keep increases, the cell keeps swelling and then eventually ruptures. The third and the last thing that can occur is extrusion. Extrusion is very similar to fusing where it fuses with the plasma membrane and leaves the host cell. Now, we just went over the viral life cycle, the infection, the translation, the making of progeny, and the progeny being released. But for some types of bacteriophages, there are two other phases that are seen, and these phases are called lytic cycle and lysogenic cycle. The lytic cycle is actually very similar to lysis, except while going through the process of lysis, it can also enter the process of lysogenic cycle. Eventually, the lysogenic cycle comes back and becomes lytic cycle. Lytic cycle is very similar to the life cycle of other viruses. First, the bacteriophage infects the bacteria with the genetic material, then it's replicated, forming viral progeny which is released through the process of lysis.
If the DNA synthesized from the bacteriophage's RNA enters the nucleus and does not integrate into bacterial genome, then it goes through the lytic cycle. But if the DNA does integrate into the bacterial genome, then it enters the lysogenic cycle. During the lysogenic cycle, the viral DNA replicates with the host genome and produces daughter cells, allowing the virus to spread. The lysogenic cycle continues by continuously producing daughter cells, or it enters the lytic cycle by separating its genome from the host's genome. Now that we've learned everything about viruses, I want you to bring your attention back to the question that we initially saw. The best way to answer a question, especially under time constraint, is use a process of elimination. The answers could be broken down to three main things. The first thing is DNA versus RNA. Viruses carry both DNA, RNA, single and double strand genetic material. However, DNA does not require the virus to carry any enzymes for it to be processed. It solely relies on the host cell. Viruses with RNA single strands, however, do carry enzymes sometimes. This information is enough to help us eliminate two choices, choice C and D. The second key piece of information requires the knowledge of knowing the difference between positive sense and negative sense. Positive, think good, less work, there is no enzyme needed. RNA is directly translated to protein. Negative sense, think the opposite, it's bad, it's more work, and extra enzyme is needed in order to make an RNA complementary strand. Without even knowing the difference between RNA replicase or reverse transcriptase, you can see that the answer is A. If you didn't know the difference between negative sense and positive sense, Knowing RNA replicase versus reverse transcriptase would have helped eliminate choice B to get your answer A. RNA replicase is exactly what it sounds like. It replicates RNA to make a complementary strand. Reverse transcriptase is carried by retroviruses, and as made obvious by its name, it reverses transcription. So it synthesizes DNA from a RNA strand. Keeping everything in mind that we learned, we can see that the answer is A, negative sense single strand RNA with RNA replicase. Well, that brings us to the end of our video. I hope you liked the way question guided our learning. If you did or did not, please let me know in the comments below. I appreciate all feedback, all criticism, and if there's any topics that you'd like to see, please let me know. And while you're at it, do not forget to check out my other videos on my YouTube channel and please don't forget to like and subscribe.